It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I'd like everyone in this House to think about where they were on November 10, 2016. It was a particularly windy day in Ontario, and I can tell you what this government was doing on November 10. This government was exporting surplus power, wow. so much surplus power that Ontario might have set a record for power wasted. How much power did they waste, Mr. Speaker, on November 10th? They wasted $9.4 million worth of power. Wow. Now, Mr. Speaker, that might have been a record day for this government in terms of wasted power. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Stop the clock, please. I'm. Uh... You're not helping. I'm getting attention for your leader. Uh, it does seem like um, uh, my calm request is not going to be heard, so uh, I may have to move as quickly as possible to get control. So please uh, don't make me get up again. I'd appreciate that. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, I guess the government's a little bit touchy when it that comes to their power giveaways, the yeah. electricity giveaways. Sure so are. my question, Mr. Question. Speaker, was the government trying to set a new Ontario record that day for surplus electricity? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to stand and, and, and talk about remembering, Mr. Speaker, because I know every Ontarian remembers where they were in August of 2003 when that government actually let, it, let our system disintegrate, Mr. Speaker, and have blocks right out, Mr. Speaker. I know that, Mr. Speaker that we will continue to ensure that we invest in a system that is clean and reliable, Mr. Speaker. And I know that they don't... Order, please. Order, please. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will withdraw. And the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. We're now moving to warnings. And if it continues, we'll go into naming. I'm getting control today. Finish, please. You have one wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of touchy, um, you know what, Mr. Speaker? We, we make sure that we have a reliable system, Mr. Speaker. We invested, we've made it clean, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to have a great system, something that we can be proud of. When it comes to, to exports, Mr. Speaker, we are an ex exporter, and the net benefit of those exports to ratepayers was $230 million in 2015, Mr. Speaker. Much better than actually having to spend $500 million like they used to. They used to have to pay to import electricity. Mr. Speaker, we thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I have a serious question for the Premier. Rather than reinventing history and talking about a power failure in Ohio, I would appreciate an answer. We have a serious problem with surplus power in the province. So on November 10th, we gave away $9.4 million worth of surplus power. How much did we get for that? Any guesses? $144,000. We gave away $9.4 million worth of surplus power, and we got back $144,000. This is embarrassing for the province of Ontario. We are hurting our businesses. We are subsidizing competitors. And so my question to the Premier, and I know she's going to want to pass this off because she doesn't want to assume responsibility for this failure, but my question is, did the governors from New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania actually send us a thank you note and if so what did the thank you note say for all your great thank work you. on behalf of Pennsylvania New York thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it's obvious that the Leader of the Opposition has no idea how this system works, Mr. Speaker. At the end of the year, when you actually look at the books, Mr. Speaker, we make $230 million. But let's not forget, so in 2003, Mr. Speaker, when they had the blackout, when they let the system crash, Mr. Speaker, they spent $400 million to import electricity. The member from the member from Simcoe Gray is warned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, in 2003, Ontario paid $400 million to import electricity, Mr. Speaker. We've made the investments now to ensure that we don't have to import electricity, that we're an ex exporter, Mr. Speaker. We create a system in which we can make money now. We make $230 million at the end of the year, Mr. Speaker. 2015, $230 million. 2014, $300 million, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure that our system is clean, we no longer Answer. have coal, Mr. Speaker, it is reliable, and it is something, Mr. Speaker, that they left in tatters and we had to fix, Mr. Thank Speaker. Again to the Premier, and once again, I hope that the Premier eventually will answer one of these questions rather than passing the buck. And so it's bad enough that we have, we're giving away surplus power, subsidizing our competitors in the states, and the government doesn't want to answer that, but we also have this fire sale of Hydro One, which has been denounced. 200 municipalities passing resolutions saying it's a bad idea. 80 percent of Ontarians and polls saying don't proceed. Stop the clock. The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport and the Minister of Housing are warned. Now go ahead and blame each other, but you all have control of yourselves. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, the financial accountability officer saying this fire sale of Hydro One is a bad deal. Then you've got the cloud over the fundraiser for the Liberal Party that happened just after the fire sale by high-powered bankers. Right. And now we have a lawsuit. Mr. Speaker, now the government is under a cloud of a lawsuit alleging wrongdoing with this fire sale. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is with all these concerns, with all this opposition, both inside Queen's Park, legislative question. office, municipalities, and now a lawsuit. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing and put a pause on the fire sale of Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, um, the broadening of the sale is actually allowing us to invest in infrastructure and transit, Mr. Speaker, and the, so much, so much of it, Mr. Speaker, that I think it's important for me to talk about some of the great work that's being done by the Ministry of Transportation and the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if I the member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from Chatham Kent Essex is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So here's just some of the uh, projects that were committed to, uh, through the 2015 and 2016 Ontario budgets that come from this, Mr. Speaker. $13.5 billion for GO Regional Express Rail, 12 new GO stations along Kitchener, Barrie, Lakeshore East GO, um, train service, GO Rail service. Yes. We're going to play. I'm going to win. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Carry on. Bus service between go bus service between Cambridge and Milton. Um, 43 million for proposed multimodal hub in Kitchener. Double the number of weekday trips along the Kitchener yeah, go sir. corridor. As well, Mr. Speaker, Highway 69 is being uh, you know four lane turning into a 400 series of highways. Thank you. There are investments happening. Thank you. Good question. The leader of the opposition. Mr. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Three questions on hydro, no answer. Obviously, the Premier does not want to be on the record on hydro. So I'm going to try something different, and maybe the Premier will choose to answer this, this time on health care. Now, hopefully you don't pass this question as well. The government's talking points has been that the wait times are the lowest. But we found out in the Auditor General's report that this Liberal talking point is not true. Stop the clock. The member from uh, Etobicoke North is warned. If you haven't got the message, I'll move right to, to naming, which I loathe to do. 
Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General said that patients visiting the emergency room or having surgery are now waiting longer now than any time in the past 20 years. This is directly from the Auditor General, in complete contradiction with what the Liberals have been saying on wait times. Patients are being rationed health care in this province. Question. Patients are suffering. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier directly, the Auditor General says the wait times are the worst in 20 years. Will you tell us the Thank truth? You. How have you allowed this to happen? Thank you. Premier. Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it gives me the opportunity to say, thank goodness we started measuring wait times in this province. It was that party, it was the op the, the opposition party that didn't even bother to measure wait times for important <laughs> surgical procedures, for wait times in ERs. And what we found, Mr. Speaker, what we found when we came into office in 2003, as a result of that opposition party when they were in government under Mike Harris, we found that we had the longest wait times in all of Canada, Mr. Speaker. And now, as we measure those consistently year after year and make that information publicly available, we have some of the shortest, if not the shortest, wait times for surgical procedures, Mr. Speaker, for ER wait times, Mr. Speaker. We have the shortest wait times in the entire country for access to MRI and CT and ultrasound. And we've seen a decrease despite increasing Answer. population and the wait times in our ERs. That's because we're measuring it, and that's because we fixed their mess, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, this is my fifth question today, and I've yet to receive an answer from the Premier. So, you know, a story that was shared with my office was the story of Philomena Zita. She's 81 years old, and she was taken to the hospital last week after suffering a stroke. Ms. Zita was placed on a stretcher along the hallway of an emergency room against a wall. She remained there for 32 hours with a hospital gown tucked under her head as a pillow. When her family asked if this was normal, the hospital staff said, I quote, this is our Ontario health care system. Yes, it is. Mr. Speaker, I didn't get an answer on having the longest wait times in 20 years, according to the Auditor General. Now we've got the story of Philomena Zita. And my question directly to the Premier, and I would appreciate an answer, is how can you allow this question. to happen in the province of Ontario? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General has pointed us in the direction of how we can continue to make improvements. But it's important to remind the public, Mr. Speaker, that the member, the leader of the official opposition, who speaks so eloquently about the need for health care services. In 2013, it was Patrick Brown's government in Ottawa that closed the Health Council of Canada. Yeah. In 2012, it was Patrick Brown's government in Ottawa that closed the National Aboriginal Health Organization. Yeah. He was part of a government that cut hundreds of jobs from Health Canada, Mr. Speaker. He voted for a budget that axed the Canadian Immigration Interim Federal Program for Health Care for Refugees. Mr. Speaker, and in 2011, he was part of a government that Answer. unilaterally announced they would scale back federal he health That's transfers, right. costing the provinces $36 billion in health care for 10 years. Please tell me no. After recognizing your voice, order, please. Well, what do you think? Order, please. <laughs> Final supplement. Mr. Speaker, for the sixth time, I have a question for the Premier. I have yet to have a single question answered today. Maybe on the sixth time, we'll finally get an answer or a response. You know, Hearing these these liberal spins, all of a sudden I was leading a government. It just makes you shake your head of how desperate they are to divert responsibility. 
Back to the Auditor General on health care. The Auditor General. You want to take that chance? The Minister of uh, uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Finish, please. In each of the hospitals the Auditor General visited, only one operating room remained open on evenings, weekends, or holidays. And that was just for emergency surgeries. They closed operating rooms for March break from anywhere between two and ten weeks in the summer. That's unacceptable. Shameful. Doctors are willing to work. They want to work. Hospitals have the rooms and space available. Patients need the surgery, but it's this Liberal government Question. that is stopping them. So, Mr. Speaker, for the last time today, will the Premier finally answer a question and say how has she allowed this erosion of health care to take place? So we need to remember that it was his party in the last election that promised to cut 100,000 jobs, many of them, Mr. Speaker, in health care. In fact, it was his party, Mr. Speaker, that fired 6,000 nurses in this province, and it was his party that closed 10,000 hospital beds, Mr. Speaker. So no, I have no doubt that just like under their party, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have no doubt that just like in 2003, under their party's leadership in government, we had electricity brownouts and blackouts. With that party in power again, we will have a health care brownout, Mr. Patrick Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier began this uh, session by promising a reset. I hoped that this would signal uh, that people would see the bold change that is needed in this province, but since September, instead of making hydro more affordable, the Premier is still selling Hydro One. Instead of fixing our health care system, new data shows that 60 per cent of our hospitals have an unsafe level of overcrowding. Instead of creating opportunity and good jobs, young people are earning less and struggling to find work. People can't wait forever, Speaker. When will Ontarians see some action on these files that they need to see action on? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, on a range of uh, issues that the uh, the leader of the third party has referenced, we are we are working. So I don't know if the leader of the third party remembers the throne speech, Mr. Speak, Mr. Speaker, but we made we made uh, an announcement in the throne speech that we would be reducing people's electricity costs as of January 1st, taking the uh, PST, the uh, provincial portion of the HST, off their bills, Mr. Speaker. And that was an idea that had come from many places, including from the, uh, the third party. So, Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward. We are taking action. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, we need to look at we need to look at what's happening in the economy in Ontario. Look at the number of jobs that have been created. Look at the fact that we are leading the country in uh, economic growth, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there is more to be done. We recognize that yes, everyone needs to feel that growth, Mr. Speaker, but we are on a path that is leading to economic growth Thank in you. this province that is leading the country. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, people across Ontario want to have a reason to be hopeful. The thing is, they know what a great place this can be, but they're worried. They're worried that even though life is tough today, their kids, the next generation, won't have the opportunities they did. And unless, unless we see some big changes, it's only going to make life harder here in Ontario. It's going to make it harder to create a good life here. Will this Premier tell Ontarians why she didn't use this past session to make the changes that people need to see? 
Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the changes that we're making. Let's talk about the investment in 100,000 childcare spaces, Mr. Speaker, that we are making. Let's talk about the fact that we are just this morning, Mr. Speaker, we made an announcement about community benefits projects that are going to tie job creation for young people who otherwise would not have access to the job market. Are going to tie those training opportunities to the building of infrastructure. Infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that the third party does not support building, but we are building and we're tying job creation to that infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So those are the kinds of changes that are leading to the growth that we are seeing in the province. Those are the kinds of changes that we are making that will ensure a bright future for this province, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And that is exactly what government exists to do. Final supplementary. People who own or work for a small business know that skyrocketing hydro costs are threatening their future. Right. Hospitals are overcrowded and underfunded. The Premier, who is a former education minister and trustee, has let schools crumble and repair backlogs grow. And it is harder than ever to get a good job in this province, a good job in this province with benefits and decent wages. And that's not what people voted for, Speaker. They're disappointed because they expected so much more from this Premier. With one more day in the session, Speaker, will the Premier commit to the action that people need to see to make life better for them and their kids here in Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, if the, leader of the if the leader of the third party is asking whether we will commit to rebuilding and renovating and building new schools, yes, we will. Yes, We're doing we that, will. Mr. Speaker. If the leader of the third party is asking, will we work on wait times? Will we make sure that people have access to primary care, Mr. Speaker? Will we make sure that they have more direct access by putting in place legislation that will guarantee that? Yes, we will, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing that. The member from Kitchener-Waterloo is warned. Carry on. If the leader of the third party is asking whether we will make tuition free for low-income students in this province, Mr. Speaker, yes, we will. We are doing that so that every young person in this province will pay, will go to post-secondary, and will have the life that they deserve and that they're capable of, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are doing all those things. Okay. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. <coughs> New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier as well. But what I have to ask is, why is it that after 13 years of Liberals in charge in this province, things have gotten so bad? That's the question that this Premier needs to answer. And you know what, Speaker? The Auditor General has confirmed it. The Auditor General on the health care file alone has confirmed it. 60 per cent of our hospitals are dangerously overcrowded. St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener, the Grand River Hospital in Waterloo are regularly overcrowded, but that's okay because I guess people can just go to Guelph, right? No. Guelph General has been overcrowded for two and a half years. How many people in Kitchener, Waterloo and Guelph have been treated in hallways or gotten an infection? in an overcrowded hospital. Mr. Speaker, you know, I, the, um, the uh, leader of the third party referenced my, uh, my work as a, as a school trustee, and I know she will understand that as a former uh, educator and, uh, and school trustee, she'll understand that when we came into office and the graduation rate in this province from high school was 68 per cent, Mr. Speaker, we thought that was not that was not adequate. And Mr. Speaker, the graduation rate now is 85 point five. Yeah. So you know, the, the changes that we have made in this province in education, in health care, in investment in infrastructure, in investment in a, an elect a clean electricity grid that's reliable, Mr. Speaker, those are all changes that affect people's lives every single day. Now, is there more to do? Is there more that we need to do to make sure that yes, health care and education and electricity, that all of those things work for people? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. But has there been improvement on our watch? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. New question. Oh, sorry. 
supplement. Toronto hospitals are overcrowded as well, Speaker, and it means going to the hospital could leave you sicker than when you went in. Here in Toronto, North York General, Sick Kids, St. Joseph's Healthcare, Toronto General, Sunnybrook, and St. Mike's are all overcrowded. Will the Premier tell us how many people in these hospitals here in Toronto have been treated in a hallway and how many got an infection because of the hospital overcrowding in Toronto's hospitals. Thank you, you know, I, I do understand that uh, negativity is a, it's a tactic, it's a strategy, it's something that opposition parties uh, choose, to, choose to use, Mr. Speaker, and I understand that it is their job to point out where there are challenges and where there needs to be improvement. But, Mr. Speaker, I am not going to buy into the denigration of the health care system in this province. I am not going to buy into uh, a, a notion that somehow the hospitals and the health care workers in this province are not doing an excellent job, because they are, Mr. Speaker. And I know that because I go into those hospitals. I talk to the people who are working in those hospitals. My grandchild, my first grandchild was born in North York General, Mr. Speaker. It's a fantastic hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunnybrook Hospital is in my riding, Mr. Speaker. It's a fantastic hospital that delivers Answer. wonderful service. That's the health care system in Ontario. Is there more to do? Absolutely. $345 million for hospitals in the budget, another $140 million. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it's the government that's not doing a good job when it comes to the hospital. Four years of frozen budgets, year and year after that, of underinflationary funding. That's the problem in our hospital system, and it's leading to a crisis of overcrowding. And the Premier is denying it yet again, just as she did yesterday. 85% occupancy. That's what's considered a safe lever for hospitals. But according to the Auditor General, 60 percent of Ontario's hospitals are overcrowded. Some are filled to over 100 percent capacity. Speaker. In 2014, the president of the Canadian Medical Association described how hospitals deal with occupancy rates that are over 100 percent and people being put in overcapacity beds. Here's what he said. What they really are are windowless nooks, crannies, and Question. room closets anywhere we can squeeze in a stretcher or a bed. End quote. When will this government, when will this government fund hospitals Thank properly you. and develop policies to stop? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, there's always more work to be done, and that's why we uh, introduced and will be voting on the Patients First Act shortly. And I uh, look forward to the uh, response of the third party. But I actually would prefer to take the, the perspective, Mr. Speaker. I actually prefer to take the perspective of my critic in the NDP party, who, and I agree with her on this point, where she rightly said that she was speaking initially about Ontario's cancer services, saying they are one of the best in the world, which is true. And then she went on to say, we have an excellent health care system and an excellent cancer care system. Yeah. I happen to agree with that assessment, and, Mr. Sir. Speaker. Uh, and in fact, literally every third party analysis of our health care system ranks it as the best or one of the best Thank in you. the entire country. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Speaker, this Liberal government doesn't want to take a clear stand when it comes to road tolls. That's because Liberal members outside of the downtown core know their constituents can't afford them. Because they know they can't afford Stop the clock, please. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is warned. Carry on. It's because they know that they can't afford to pay new tolls. Those members need to stand up for their constituents. Mr. Here. Speaker, will the Premier allow her members to vote with their constituents and against road tolls 
on our leader's Decide. private member's motion tomorrow. Here, here. Stand up. Very much, uh, Speaker. You know, it's interesting. I know over the last couple of days this topic has come up a number of times. What uh, what confuses, I think, not only me, Speaker, but Don't let uh, it confuse I would argue yes or no. confuses most people across the province of Ontario as it relates to uh, where the leader of the opposition stands on this particular issue. Speaker, I'm looking at a quote from uh, Patrick Brown, from the Leader of the Opposition, from the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce just a few months ago, July 25th of this year. Oh, wow. uh, here's the quote I read, Speaker. I don't think it's appropriate for the province to come in and say, we know best, when frankly it should be the local issues that have the best sense of where the gridlock exists, oh, Speaker. Interesting. Speaker, just a, 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 the day later, a day later in the Hamilton Spectator, another quote from the Leader of the Opposition. I respect the autonomy of municipalities. Oh. If the mayor and council have stated very clearly that that's where they want the provincial partnership to be, Speaker. That's where it'll be, Speaker. Yes, and this morning on CBC's Metro Morning, Speaker, that leader said, what I have said on road tolls is that I'm not against them completely, Speaker. Ah. Well, the real Pat Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker, the members for Durham Region, York Region, Brampton, Mississauga, Oakville, Scarborough, Mark. Etobicoke, and Waterloo Region need to stand up stand for up. their constituents. Yeah. They need to vote for their constituents, constituents who want no part in highway tolls. Now, Speaker, something tells me they will be forced to vote the way the Premier's office tells them. They need to decide if they're with the constituents or Premier Kathleen Wynne. Mr. Speaker, I'll ask again. Will the Liberal members be allowed to stand up and vote with their constituents and against road tolls. Here, stand up. Mr. President. Uh, speaker, I thank the member for the follow-up question. Here's another quote from the Durham Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, Durham, in the 905, August 29, 2016, Speaker, from the Leader of the Opposition. Quote, we have to reflect what the top priorities are in each community by looking at what the council is saying. Ah. And if there's a resolution of council saying that this is where the top priority is, then governments should try to work with our municipal partners to respect the municipal wishes, Speaker. Ah. I think there's additional confusion, Speaker, because the only party that's ever come forward with a plan to toll in this province, at the provincial level, broadly speaking, has been the Conservative Party with the 407, and then, Speaker, not more than a year or two later, they sold the 407. Whoa, they killed the Eglinton subway. They didn't just kill the Eglinton subway, Speaker. They killed it and they filled it. Speaker, both of those transportation decisions continue to haunt the people of this Answer. region and the people of this province. We will no, not go back to those days, Speaker. We're building the province Thank up you. and we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question, the member from Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Clark. The member from Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. I have a question on behalf of the Premier's own constituents. Aidan Wellsman is just 16. He was going blind and he desperately needed surgery. Yes. But his family was shocked and appalled to learn that OHIP wouldn't pay for the surgery to save Aiden's sight. His parents were forced to choose between thousands of dollars out of pocket or let their son, their child, go blind. It was an absolute nightmare. No parents in this province should be let down so badly by their own government. How can the Premier say that she believes in Medicare, where care is based on needs, not on ability to pay, and at the same time refuse to cover aid in surgery, a surgery that is covered by many other provinces. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my heart goes, uh, my heart goes out to the family, to uh, this young man, and to his parents, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know that the Minister of Health will uh, will speak to the uh, to the specifics of the way decisions are made around these very, very difficult, difficult uh, issues, Mr. Speaker. But what I will say is that it is extremely important in a healthcare system as large as ours that we have evidence-based decision-making, Mr. Speaker, that we have a 
system that relies on the expert evidence and that those decisions are made in, uh, in as objective a way as possible, Mr. Speaker, based on the evidence. That is, that is paramount in a, in a system as large as uh, we have in Ontario. Um, so Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health will speak to, uh, to that decision-making process in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I believe in decision made based on evidence. No problem about that. But exactly how much effort is the Premier putting in developing the body of evidence that would allow us to make that decision? It has been five long years that Ontario is studying these procedures. Every other province have concluded their body of evidence and supported the surgery, but we are still reviewing. Meanwhile, Aidan Wells deserve a bright future. In his time of need, this province said that he would have to go blind first before he could get any help from this government. This is senseless, and frankly, this is mean. Families like Aidan face the first dilemmas of them all. Let your child go blind or pay for a surgery that you can't afford. <laughs> Member Premier, with Medicare, care is based on needs, not on ability to pay. Why is this government putting the future of kids like Aiden at risk by refusing to cover the surgery to save the Thank you. Mr. Health and Long -term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, our decisions are based on need, but they're also based on evidence and science and expert advice. So the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee, or OTAC, because we took the politics out of the decision-making uh, for these types of procedures, OTAC recommended that this is for corneal cross-link surgery, that it be made available in a limited fashion because they determined that more evidence was needed to establish corneal cross-linking surgery as an appropriate alternative treatment pathway for patients with certain medical conditions. So notwithstanding that decision by the Technical Advisory Committee, we made corneal cross-link surgery available through Kensington uh, on a conditional funding program, not through OHIP because the science wasn't there, but we made it available. We've quadrupled the funding for it. Answer. We're anticipating having the results of that pilot available in the next few months, and we'll make an evidence and science-based decision based on the results of that Thank report. Question the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. I know that the members of my community rely on transport each and every day. Whether they are a student who commutes from Barrie to York University, or a parent who works in downtown Toronto, or a senior who can now visit their grandchildren in Toronto, they need a reliable way to get from Barrie to school or work and back home again. When members of my community first heard about our government's 10-year Go Regional Express plan, an investment of $13.5 billion, they were absolutely thrilled. That is because they knew that this investment would have a meaningful impact on their everyday lives and the way in which they move around the region. Ever since that announcement, I hear often from constituents who are eager to know what they can expect, when they can expect increased service along the Barry Question. Line. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us when the residents of Barry will see service improvements as part of our government's Go RER plan? Thank you. Mr. Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barry for her question today and also for welcom welcoming me to her community just a couple of days ago where we made a very important announcement, an announcement I know she's been advocating for for some time. Starting December 31st, Speaker, this New Year's Eve, we are introducing new all-year-round weekend and holiday go service to Barrie, Speaker. This service, service this, uh, Speaker, this important service will include three trips from Allendale Go Station in Barrie to Union Station in the morning and three back in the evening for customers traveling between Toronto back home to Barry. Speaker, this is an extremely important step. It's an important demonstration of meaningful progress with respect to delivering two-way all-day go service on the Barry corridor. Speaker, it means for the first time ever year-round on weekends and holidays that the people of Barry will be able to get yes, downtown sir. to see a sports game, have dinner, see a show, and be able to get back home safely in the evening. Speaker, thank thanks you. very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I was very pleased to have the minister in Barrie on Monday for such an important announcement, and I've already heard from residents who plan to take full advantage of the new weekend and holiday service. 
While I know this investment means a great deal to GO Train riders in my riding, it also means the world to our local businesses. For them, increased weekend and holiday service means new people from across the GTA coming to Barrie to experience all that my city has to offer. For instance, this opens the door for more people to come to Barrie to attend classic events like Kempenfest, an arts and crafts festival that also features great food and entertainment. Torontonians would also enjoy the wonderful protections of Talk is Free Theatre. If it's too hot in Toronto in the summer, families are now able to ride the go to the beautiful sandy Centennial Beach, which is right across from the go space. Question. Will the minister please provide members of this house with information on the service announcement he made yesterday at the site of the future Downsview go station? Thank you, minister. Thanks very much, speaker. I thank the member from Barrie for the follow-up question. Speaker, in addition to the announcement that we made on Monday in Barrie, I was pleased yesterday to join the member from Newmarket Aurora, the Minister of uh, Housing and the Minister Responsible for Poverty Reduction, and our member from York Centre Speaker to announce that also starting this December 31st, this New Year's Eve, we will be introducing weekend and holiday year-round GO Train service throughout the day with trains running at 75-minute intervals or better between Union Station and Aurora Station. Speaker. Oh, wow. These service improvements are yet another example of our plan at work. Speaker. I think it's important to stress, and I can see nodding heads right around this chamber, members of every caucus, supporting the fact that we're delivering more. Speaker. I would simply say that I call on opposition parties to join with us to support budgets, to support the investments we're making in critical transit infrastructure so that we can make Answer. sure that communities along the Barrie Corridor, in York Region, in Toronto, in Kitchener-Waterloo, right across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, have the transit network that they need. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton, Fort Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions to the Premier. A group of constituents from the riding of Peterborough, including Mayor Giroux and council members from the township of Havelock, Belmont, Methune, are here today calling on the government to invest in much needed long term care beds. Since 2009, the township has been campaigning for a long term care home in the community, and they have partnered with uh, AON Inc. to build it. They presented their application for a 128-bed facility in 2011, but the ministry eventually responded by saying that they are not issuing any new licenses for new long-term care go. homes. In Peterborough area, there is currently a wait list of over 2,700 people in need of long-term care, which has the longest wait lists for long-term care beds in the whole province. And where and here. We have a well-prepared plan ready to go, yet the government has done nothing. Question. Will the Premier commit to overturning her government's decision on this application and tell the good people from the township gathered outside that they will be getting their long-term care beds that they so desperately need? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question because it gives me the opportunity to express my gratitude and appreciation to the MPP from Peterborough, uh, because he has been, he and I have been discussing this issue uh, intensively, intensively, Mr. Speaker. No, it's unfortunate that it took uh, uh, individuals coming to uh, Toronto for you to, for the first time, to actually raise this. The, the, the MPP from Peterborough, Mr. Speaker, and I have been working uh, diligently on this issue. We had a meeting uh, recently specifically uh, on the Havelock proposal. I directed my office to become directly involved as they are. They've spoken. My office has spoken with the mayor. My office has spoken with the chief administrative officer as well. We're looking yes, and working sir. to see if we can find a solution. A solution, Mr. Speaker, that I believe uh, meets the community's needs, but also understands that there are a variety of mechanisms in Thank place you. that can address this need, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A little bit uh, below the belt. The member's been working on this for a very long time, and you know that. Yeah, we've heard that Back right. to the Premier, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians are very low. weary of her government. Like Everything it touches ended up, ends up in scandal, waste, a mistake, or a broken promise from you, Premier. Your government wasted $8 billion on a flawed e-health system Still while 24,000 frail seniors Chair, continue to go without access to a nursing bed. This is unacceptable, Speaker. I've been trying valiantly to get this government to show us their capacity plan and say where they will build the promised new long-term care Nothing. beds. Nothing. Considering 
the Premier does not intend to put the needed beds in Havelock, Belmont, Methan. Sad. Will you admit that there never was a capacity plan for new beds and that your government has no plan to house the frail seniors on the way here? Here, no plan. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have been working hard over the past years where, to the point where we have roughly doubled our investments in long-term care. Wow. We've built, since coming into the office, 10,000 long-term care beds. We're in the middle of a process now where we're redeveloping an additional 30,000 long-term care beds. We are adding staff to our long-term care facilities, including, importantly, and we added to that investment this year with new dollars, importantly, for behavioral supports, because we recognize that the acuity is becoming uh, more challenging. Uh, there are more individuals in our long-term care homes with dementia, uh, with Alzheimer's, uh, forms of dementia, Mr. Speaker. But we are making those important investments. We're adding the staff. In fact, we have added 1,200 nursing positions in our long-term care homes since 2008. There's more work to be done. Yes, of course, as we see, we have a, both a growing population and an aging population, but that's work that we're undertaking, including capacity planning. Yeah. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, workers at Peel Region Children's Aid Society have been on strike since September, not about wages, but about workload. Yesterday, the workers voted on the employer's last offer, and they rejected it with 93 per cent of the vote. Now the workers want to get back to bargaining. They've looked to the minister, and they've received nothing. Premier, with the vulnerable kids and families in Peel desperate for help and the workers wanting to get back to work, where has your government been? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member for the question. I just want to take an opportunity to, uh, to thank the men and women uh, from the Children's Aid Society here joining us in the Legislature today. I recognize that they are hard workers and they're uh, working evenings and evenings in many many cases to protect our children and I just want to say on behalf of the government thank you for the work that you do uh, Mr. Speaker I understand that there's efforts that are uh, underway uh, we need to make sure that uh, process is followed I'm optimistic that um, the union and the employer are going to be able to find a resolution at the end and that's uh, and I believe that, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've put in place the proper oversight to ensure that uh, the services are continuing to, to be served. We've made sure uh, that uh, yes, we monitor this uh, society on a daily basis and that uh, we're confirming that mandated services are being delivered, Mr. Speaker, and that the contingency plan is being followed. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Families and children don't want to be thanked. They want to see this issue resolved. That's why weeks ago, QP proposed a compromise, end the strike, and let everyone get back to work by sending the few outstanding issues to binding arbitration, but the employer refused. CIS management wanted to force a vote. And now they have a result, but it's still unresolved. Speaker, why did the Premier let caseload soar, morale sink, and the work stoppage drag on, affecting the most vulnerable kids and families in Peel? Minister, uh, Minister of Labour. Sure, Labour. Thank, you. Thank you to the member for that question. Uh, Speaker, last night a vote was held. Uh, QP was able to vote. The QP members took place in a vote. I think they clearly expressed their will in that regard, Speaker, and we certainly respect that. I know this morning the parties have been in touch with my ministry, Speaker. I've assigned, their, I've assigned my senior arbitrator to the case, Speaker. I think that both parties, as a result of the vote last night, are taking a look at this through fresh eyes, Speaker. At the Ministry of Labour, what we want to ensure is that in the vast majority of cases in the province of Ontario, 98 per cent, Speaker, of collective agreements are put in place with no strike, with no resort to lockout. In this case, Speaker, that hasn't happened, Speaker. We think that the parties can come to agreement. We're prepared to work with them this morning. They both have been in touch with my ministry. Yes, we're, we're prepared to support that resolution, Speaker, because we need these workers back on the job. Thank speaker. you. Thank you. New question. 
The member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, many of us will remember how gasoline prices soared a few years ago. We were paying up to $1.30 a litre to fill our tanks. But gas prices in Ontario have fallen sharply in recent years. Regular operation of the market has ensured that these savings are being passed on to consumers. At the same time, many families have expressed concern over the fluctuating cost of gasoline. Prices sometimes spike unexpectedly and often have great variation from one area to the next without any obvious explanation to consumers. The minister recently announced that he's seeking a review of the transportation fuel market to provide greater insight for Ontario drivers. Great Speaker, idea. could the minister please tell this House how this review is going to provide consumers with more transparency of the fuel Question. market? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to thank the hardworking member for Kitchener for that question. Mr. Speaker, families in Ontario are concerned about the prices they face at the pump, and I know, Mr. Speaker, particularly in, in northern Ontario. Um, they have asked for more information on just how these gasoline and diesel prices are set. So, Mr. Speaker, I've heard these concerns, and so I ask the Ontario Energy Board to conduct, conduct a thorough review of the Ontario fuels market, and transparency, Mr. Speaker, will be the cornerstone of this report. So, in the coming months, the Ontario Energy Board will consult with key stakeholders and reveal three items. First, Mr. Speaker, they will explore the causes of price variations across the province. Second, they will identify how the Ontario market compares with other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. And finally, they will examine what information is made available to consumers about pricing Answer. and price variations. So, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Energy plans to use this report to identify gaps in information about the fuel market and, as a better result, to serve customers. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his answer and let him know that we miss him here in the back seat, right? <laughs> um, we know that there are a number of factors that go into retail gas prices in Ontario. You've got crude oil costs, taxes, and the retail margin. These are all components of the price that consumers pay at the pumps. Historically, our province's gasoline market has fared very well. Ontario cities often have the lowest gas prices in all of Canada. A detailed report of the gasoline market will certainly help consumers identify these price components and understand how Ontario compares to the rest of the country. Mr. Speaker, the minister referred to stakeholders being consulted as part of this retail process. Uh, could he please identify some of the stakeholders who he's going to be consulting in this upcoming review? Thank you, Minister. Good question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for that uh, question and for the supplementary as well, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, as the member indicated, uh, our ministry is listening carefully to the stakeholders most affected by varying fuel prices, Mr. Speaker. In addition to consulting with the general public, um, the OEB will start conversations with the retail transportation fuels industry, the Federal Competition Bureau, Mr. Speaker, and other external experts that are on this issue. Um, the ministry, Mr. Speaker, is also in the midst of consultations on the next long-term energy plan. Uh, the review will be complementary with this planning process, Mr. Speaker, contributing to a greater understanding uh, and a path forward to the transportation fuel sector. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when I was uh, at the federal level, I was a vocal advocate on this topic about gasoline Answer. prices in Ontario. And now, as Minister, Mr. You know Speaker, I am pleased to be part of a plan which will be more transparent for Ontarios on this important issue, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you very much. Question the member from Elgin Mills, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, this morning we've witnessed another example of how this government uses studies and committees to delay and ration health care. Aiden, we've heard about a healthy young high schooler has degenerative eye disease, and if left untreated, he'll legally go blind. When Aiden's parents met with ophthalmologists to review his options, they were told there is hope. There is a surgery that is available that can save Aiden's eyesight, but OHIP doesn't cover it. Speaker, other provinces have studied the scientific evidence backing this procedure and are covering it. Why, Why is the minister using more of the precious health care dollars to study it further right. when that money could actually go to the procedure yeah, yeah. and give this child his eyesight? Yeah, yeah. Will the minister act and give this child his procedure? 
Well, Mr. Speaker, it's because we're following the advice of the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee. We didn't make a political decision. I didn't make a decision on whether or not to fund this. We followed the advice of our scientific and clinical evidence-based experts who told us that we should, on a pilot basis, an experimental basis, that we should fund in a limited fashion this procedure, which is one of a number of options that's available for individuals with particular medical conditions. And so on that basis, following the direction of the advisory committee, which I would hope that members of this legislature would agree is an appropriate uh, approach to take for coronal cross-link surgery and, quite frankly, anything we do in health care. But on that basis, we funded a conditional, uh, limited pilot program specifically for patients with progressive corneal thinning disorders. We funded that through the Kensington Eye Clinic. Uh, we continue to fund that. We've quadrupled the funding, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker, and we're close to seeing the results of that pilot. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, I, I don't think there's any common sense left in this government. Every other province has looked at this procedure, researched the scientific evidence, and said, it's a bonus. Let's do it. Let's fund it. But this government wants the, the tail wagging the dog. The bureaucracy that they keep developing and growing, as we see with Bill 41 today, is hurting patients across this province. It's time for a change, Mr. Speaker. This government's waste mismanagement in this province is becoming so rationed that kids like Aidan and another one, Balin, who has the same problem, their health outcomes rely solely on the generosity of others. Speaker, the province has been studying this issue since 2011. Wow. How many years did it take to realize this treatment is critical for suffering families? Mr. Speaker, when will the minister act? Here, here. When will the minister listen to other provinces across this country, fund the treatment, and give kids their eyesight? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and I believe that Ontario patients are best served when we make our decisions based on science and based on evidence, when we follow the explicit direction of a technical, scientific, clinical expert committee that has guided us in this particular procedure, which is one of a number of procedures, Mr. Speaker, that are available. I know that the member opposite would like to fund anything that comes before him. We have a process. We've taken the politics out of the process. It's clear to me that that party would bring the politics back in and instead of allowing clinicians, scientists, experts, technical committees established to make these difficult decisions, instead of allowing that process to take place, it's clear that the member opposite in his party would make these decisions based on politics alone. Thank you. The question, the member from Warwick. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last month, a regulation was quietly introduced that will change how much unpaid leave is available to workers in this province. Now, interesting, the change only impacts one small part of one sector, the non-unionized auto sector. The change affects the amount of personal uh, leave time, unpaid leave, a non-union non -union worker can take and it limits bereavement leave for these workers to three days. The very next week, the Premier was off to a trade mission in Japan and Korea, where she met with auto industry executives. My question is, why was this change made? Why was it made in this way so quietly, and why now? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Economic Development and Growth is going to want to, uh, to comment on this, but I will just say, Mr. Speaker, that the, uh, the trip, that, uh, the mission that, we, that I led to uh, Korea and to Japan, Mr. Speaker, was largely uh, to meet with uh, companies in the auto sector, Mr. Speaker, companies that are investing in Ontario, companies that are expanding their footprint in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, creating jobs and really fueling part of that economic growth that we are seeing in Ontario that is, uh, is leading the way in the country, Mr. Speaker. So it was a very worthwhile mission. It was very worthwhile to uh, enhance those partnerships. And Mr. Speaker, I will just say in general that we are working to find ways to help businesses to uh, remove regulatory burden, Mr. Speaker, where it is getting in the way of, uh, of businesses, sir. and at the same time, make sure that workers are kept safe and that they have uh, decent working conditions, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. That balance is what we strive for. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, how progressive uh, is actually 
supporting uh, recession, recessionary uh, issues like this for workers in this province. You know, it's funny, uh, this government has been asked whether it'll commit to make progressive changes New Democrats have called for, like a $15 minimum wage, making it easier to join and stay in a union. And the answer has been, we can't commit now. The Changing Workplaces Review is underway. Well, I can tell you the Changing Workplaces Review authors have been clear. Employers didn't engage in the review process. Not a auto manufacturer made a submission on changing unpaid leave or bereavement leave for workers. It isn't even at anywhere near close to the top of the list. So why was this made, Speaker? And why, when faced with doing the right thing for hard-working Ontarians and what's best for the powerful friends of the Liberal Party, why does this government in— Wrap up, please. Thank you, Speaker. So when the government has a choice uh, whether to actually uh, choose workers or choose their powerful friends, why does the government continue Answer. to choose their friends over the people and the workers in this province? Minister Labor. Minister Labor. Speaker, the Changing Workplaces Review now has been underway for some time, Speaker, and uh, we've had engagement from Labor. We've had engagement from advocates. We've had engagement now from the business community, Speaker. Everybody is bringing their best to the table. They're bringing their best ideas, Speaker. When you look at personal emergency leave in the province of Ontario, Speaker, it's been around for some time. It's used by employees the way that it should be used. What was suggested was that we might want to do a pilot project. We might want to see if we can bring in personal emergency leave that works in a different way but provides the same services to those people that are employed in that industry, Speaker. Speaker, we, we made this decision based on good advice. We asked, the, uh, we asked the advisors to bring forward their recommendations. We asked if they bring it forward Answer. first, Speaker. And I would outline, and I want to be very, very clear, that this is a pilot project, Speaker, to see if it works Thank in you. this particular industry. New question, the member from BTC Shore. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. Now, Speaker, we all know that it's important to have solutions across the housing spectrum to ensure that every person has an affordable home. And very recently, I had the opportunity to participate in a groundbreaking event at the village by the main station in my riding of Beaches East York, where I was pleased to learn about the great work that the nonprofit housing developer Options for Homes is doing to make home ownership a reality for low-income residents. Since 1994, Speaker, Options for Homes has helped thousands of low-income people and families obtain home ownership. And in Beaches East York, at this particular development, we're building 275 low-income units uh, where, where people are stepping up and, and buying them for their families, and I'm very, very proud to be part of it. So, Speaker, will the minister please explain to our House how the government is helping low-income families purchase a home? Thank you. Housing responsible for poverty reduction strategy. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you to the member from Beaches East York for that question and for his festive tie. Uh, the <laughs> member is correct. Providing access to uh, affordable home ownership uh, for low-income families is an important part of Ontario's long-term affordable housing strategy. Speaker, today the Government of Canada in Ontario announced $865,000 in funding for options for homes through the Investment in Affordable Housing Program. That program improves access to affordable housing for households across Ontario. Uh, we've invested over $1.6 billion, that's $1.6 billion in the Investment in Affordable Housing Answer. Program. The program gives service managers the flexibility to choose what components to fund uh, in their own communities because we understand thank they you. know best. Well, thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the minister. I'm so glad to hear that our government is making these investments in affordable housing. And I know that my constituents in Beaches, East York, who purchased this unit, extremely appreciate, very much appreciate the hard work the minister is doing to bring affordable housing in Ontario. This funding does help strengthen the economy and it will improve the quality of life for all Ontarians. And I 
heard from so many of my constituents and others across the province that we have a need to create inclusive communities with a range of housing options. And that's why, Speaker, I was so pleased to see that our government passed Bill 7, the Promoting Affordable Housing Act, yesterday afternoon in the House. Bill 7, as you know, will allow municipalities like the City of Toronto to use inclusionary zoning as a tool to create more affordable housing. Can the minister explain to the House how Bill 7 will help create even more affordable housing across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks again to the member from Beaches East York for, uh, for that question and, and, and an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Bill 7, the Promoting, uh, Promoting Affordable Housing Act, uh, which is a landmark piece of legislation, there Speaker. Is. It's going to help increase housing access and affordability for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, one of the new tools now available to municipalities is inclusionary zoning. Bill 7 gives municipalities the option to require affordable housing units to be included in residential developments. This would enable the private sector to play a much larger role in providing affordable housing. And Speaker, before I end, I just wanted to recognize the work of the member from Parkdale High Park for her advocacy on inclusionary zoning. You know, she brought forward yes, a number of bills. Inclusionary zoning is just one of the many tools that the province is moving forward with to increase the supply of affordable housing. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change, change has been made in the, ballot, the order of the precedents on the ballot list for the private member's business such that Mr. Fideli assumes ballot item number 37 and Mr. Yakubuski assumes ballot item number 42. We have uh, a point of order from the Deputy Premier. Just love to welcome two members of my constituency office staff, Neil Worley and Adam uh, Wall. Welcome. I'm delighted to have you here. Members and Welcome to Queen's, Queen's Park today, the principal of my son's school, Southwood Secondary School, Kelly Kempel. Thank you. Here, I have in my possession the final report on the August 14, 2003 blackout printed in 2004, and I'd love to give a copy to the Minister of Energy. First of all, first of all, when I stand, you sit. I'm sure you are. And also, that's not a point of order. We have deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 41, an act to amend various acts in interest of patient care center, patient-centered care. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
he wanted to do the vote. All members, please take your seats. Today, Mr. Hoskins moved third reading of Bill 41, an act to amend various acts and interests of patient-centered care. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugard. Mr. Dugard. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barardinetti. Mr. Barardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Domino. Ms. Domino. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dog. Mr. Dog. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milcher. Mr. Milcher. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mrs. McLeod. Mrs. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmascoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Oosterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Ms. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Yamanta. Ms. Yamanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 42. We want Derek Duvall. <laughs> the ayes being 53 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture, projet de loi. resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, 3 p.m. this afternoon.